But Alex, thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I just I just really want to help set the table a little bit here for really the man of the hour, Josh Farley. Professor Josh Farley just promoted to professor this week. <laughs> Yeah, so I was just reflecting on this new economy thing, and fortunately I had an opportunity to Skype with uh, David Corton earlier this week. Folks know David Corton, and probably most well known for his book, uh, When Corporations Rule the World. Um, and, and him and I were chatting exactly about this new con economy movement. We were both kind of scratching our heads, thinking, well, what? what is this new economy movement? Because just in the last few months, last few years, you keep hearing new economy, new economy, new economy. And it's kind of sweeping the nation, especially at our universities. There's a lot of different uh, new groups that are sort of lining themselves to a mission of the new economy. Certainly here in Vermont, there's a lot of traction around the notion of the new economy. Um, and we were both, you know, talking to each other like this feels like a movement man this really this is happening you know you certainly have occupy wall street and we we've had a number of teach-ins here since then and there's this, this session here and the earth week I mean, it's just fantastic but we didn't answer our question we were both we were still like what is the new new economy um and and alex said i'm supposed to try and answer that question <laughs> okay, well, I, I don't know that I have an answer, but let, let me try. Because I, I, I feel like we're in this very important transitional moment, right? And this session, and similar sessions like this across campuses across the U.S. have an opportunity to define what is a new economy. Um, at the moment, I'm not sure that we're defining a new economy or a transitional economy feels a lot like a transitional economy without a certain point. I'm not so sure if we're, we're drawing kind of on the cooperative side of the socialism, socialism end of the spectrum or the competitive side of the, the capitalistic end of the spectrum. Feel, sometimes it feels like one, sometimes it feels like the other. I'm not so sure if this new economy movement has a, a true community orientation or or really is it still grounded in kind of the individual is, is, is king, the individual is queen orientation. So it seems, seems like we're, we're, we're somewhere in that gray zone. Is it very earth-centric? Is it sort of, see, does it see earth as the whole? Or is it really the economy that's the focus and the economy is the whole and the earth is the part? I'm not sure. Um, I, I've heard it described both ways. And probably most important to, to me as an ecological economist, is this new economy movement sort of just redefining growth as a central strategy to our economy? Or is it really rethinking growth, questioning growth as a central strategy to our economy? And again, I'm not quite sure. Uh, a lot of the transitional strategies I hear is just simply greening growth or making growth tell the truth. Uh, some of our own work at the Gunn Institute and the Genuine Progress Indicator is simply sort of accepting the current system accepting the dollarization of things and trying to come up with a transitional strategy to something else, hopefully this thing called the new economy. And quite honestly, it's the same struggle that ecological economics has been in over the last three, four decades, you know, trying to define what it is we want to be when we grow up. Um, and it, it feels a lot like ecological economics to me, and, and, and David Corton and I were talking about that. Um, with one big difference. When Josh and I sort of gravitated to ecological economics in graduate school, and we actually were both at Cornell together at the same time, but he was always off in Brazil with love interests, and so I never saw him that much. <laughs> um, but we were at Cornell at the same time, and we both sort of gravitated to this thing called ecological economics. Um, with one big difference. There weren't a lot of young people involved in that movement then, and there is now which is really exciting. So I think this time around, we might actually see some traction and movement towards the new economy. Um, when I was an undergraduate in the 80s and graduate school in the 90s, the whole sort of movement, social movement thing was, was gone, man. It was just like, uh, we did a little bit around the apartheid, and we did a little bit here and there, but it was gone. Um, that, that hotbed of activity that my parents 
grew up in in the 60s and 70s where social change came from universities was, was gone. You know, all my friends went off and were investment bankers and stockbrokers, and that, that was what you did, right? You went to school, you learned economics, political science, then the two most dominant places of study, still today, <laughs> the two most popular places of study. But there wasn't much in the way of sort of social movement. It feels different now. Maybe, maybe it's just because we're in the drama ball, but I, I hope not. It feels different. Um, and, and this new economy movement has reminded me of, of, of of my own time in grad school, trying to find and search for uh, some kind of compromise between what I was learning in my science classes and what I was learning in my social science classes. So I was, I was in a program that was sort of grounded in applied economics and business. And I'd take my business classes, I'd take my economics classes, I'd take my marketing classes, I'd take my accounting classes, and thank God, I was in a program that was in a College of Agricultural Life Sciences. So they forced us to take some science, too. And I'd go over and take my science classes, and I'd go, well, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> the science classes are telling me this is how the world works, and the social science classes are telling me this is how the world works. The science classes are telling me that humans are sort of part of the fabric of life, and the social science and humanities classes are telling me that humans sit at the top of the ladder of nature. And the science classes are telling me the importance of evolution. And that social science classes are telling me, well, that's a theory, theory of evolution, but there's laws of economics. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was in school, um, I, I took this kind of quite seriously. You know, I was rather kind of sort of schizophrenic degree. Um, <laughs> rather than it's in something called natural resource economics as a grad student, but still, my master's, I said, well, I better, you know, all these economics classes that say nothing about ethics, so I, I better find some people to teach me about ethics and morals and relationships. And so I did a minor in international relations with a, with a wonderful moral ethicist, uh, Henry Shu. And then, as I got into my PhD, I was like, well, none of these, none of these social science classes are saying anything about science, I mean, and, and I really need uh, I was doing a project on forestry. It was all about just simply treating the forest as a bank account and an equation on a spreadsheet. And I said, I, I better know something about forest ecology. I'm going to say anything about forest management. So I did a minor in forest ecology. And I was still like so schizophrenic in my, my thinking. And then, walking down Warren Hall, Cornell University, the Aggie Con Department, and there's this free book pile outside of an economics professor's office. And there on the top of the free book pile is Herman Daly, Steady State Economics. Yeah. What the hell is that all about? That sounds interesting. So I grabbed a free book, read Herman Daly, and it's been, it's been a fun journey since. <laughs> and, and Josh, of course, has uh, done a lot of work with Herman Daly, written a leading textbook with Herman Daly, and uh, he's kind of the father of ecological economics. And someone in recent times who's really tried to create this sort of marriage between ecology and economics, and a real science-based view of the economy. I hope the new economy has a science-based view of the economy. It's important. Um, so ecological economics, Herman Daly, free book file. Here I, I find a vision, a narrative ec of, of economics that puts ecology first, followed by ethics, followed by economics, and it's hyper-concerned for efficiency. It puts a sort of view of the world that you've got to figure out the sustainable scale, how big should the economy be, before you can talk about how we should share and the benefits and burdens of that economy, right, both within this generation and across generations, before you can talk about how efficient that economy is. Because if we put efficiency first, and if we put equity above sustainability, then we will simply create an economy that efficiently and equitably exploits and ruins the planet. <laughs> that didn't seem to me like a very good starting point. So at least ecological economics, in my mind, kind of got the priorities straight and put, put science as foundational, as foundational to the social sciences. Now I say that to my social science colleagues. And say, no, 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 we're equal partners. Well, yeah, social science is way more complicated than natural science. And humanities is way more complicated than social sciences. But 
Underneath them is the foundation of the natural world, biophysical realities. And we learn more and more about our natural world every day. So that's what I found in ecological economics. And I found that it was a similar narrative, actually, to what you might call classical economics. So I started sort of, you know, Herman Daly's not referring to sort of the early 20th century economists. He's referring to the 18th and 19th century economists. I had never taken an economics history class as a PhD student in economics. Like, what the it, it was sort of like, why know history? Because what you currently know is the best that there ever was. Right? <laughs> that was that's, that's how economics is taught. There's no history in most economics programs. You, it's up to you to go kind of dig in some old used book pile and read about history. Daily, an ecological economist, points back to Smith, points back to Mills, points back to Ricardo, points back to a time when economics was a moral philosophy. It wasn't a social science. Its roots are in moral philosophy. Points back to a time where eco economics was grounded in sort of the biophysical realities of that transition from an agrarian economy to an industrial economy. Points back to a time where the early economists, the moral philosophers, took seriously the constraints of nature. And that root of ecological economics is just simply old wine in a new bottle. Um, my worry in recent years is that ecological economics, maybe to some extent the new economy, has been co-opted by a narrative that's not grounded in the natural sciences, that's not grounded in biophysical reality. It's been sort of wanting to, in a way, fix the free market narrative, right? I mean, free markets are amazing things. Josh is going to talk about how free markets are even possible, how capitalism is possible. But somehow ecological economics has become more about correcting market failure and less about questioning when and where markets are appropriate. I feel like the new economy is in a similar kind of place. If you think about the transitional economy, what I, a lot of what we talk about is how to fix the kind of current path we're on. How can we more efficiently and equitably exploit the planet? Right? Um, ultimately, we've got to come to terms, and this is where ecological economics has been struggling with for, for decades. We've got to come to terms with lim limits, and we've got to come to terms with equity. If we think we can get around limits by correcting for market failures, I'm not sure we're going to make it. If we think we can solve equity by getting more people into the market, I'm not sure that's a new economy. It's, it's transitionally. Maybe, it's, maybe those are good transition strategies, transitional economy. Um, but if we solve limits through correcting market failures, and if we solve equity by bringing more people into the market, then I think we're right back to efficiently and equitably exploiting and polluting the planet. Um, Bigger houses <coughs> on renewable energy, right? Let's drive the same amount in Vermont, but we're going to do it on electric cars, right? Efficiently and equitably exploit the planet. We can still buy food around the planet in the new economy, but now it's going to be organic and fairly traded food, right? It's going to be shipped to us from far corners of the planet. Um, it's a narrative of slower and fairer growth, but it's still growth, right? It's still growth. So that's my big kind of bullshit detector when I hear about the new economy, right? If it looks like growth, if it smells like growth, if it tastes like growth, then it's probably growth, right? <laughs> and we live on a fixed, finite planet. And most of our problems are come from growth. Now, a lot of them are solved with growth, and this is the problem that we have, right? Poverty solve it with growth. Equity solve it with growth, right? Environmental protection solve it with growth. You can't, you can't worry about the environment until you can afford to do so. Oh, man. 
again, back to grad school, I'm taking social science classes, I'm taking natural science classes. There's two very different narratives. There is a competing narrative that I hope the new economy will consider. And it's a competing narrative that I worry has also been co-opted by the market, free market, individualist king narrative. For a lack of a better word, it's the conservation narrative, right? It's a, a narrative that challenges the growth as good paradigm. It's a narrative that talks about austerity and limiting our wants and desires, right? It's a narrative that forces regulatory checks, that forces us to constrain ourselves. Um, it's ultimately a narrative, the conservation narrative is the only narrative I see out there that actually calls for leaving carbon in the ground. And I know that's a lot of the inspiration of, of this conference, and certainly the inspiration from the divest movement, and certainly the inspiration of 350.org and the wonderful work of Bill McKibben and doing the math and coming to the conclusion that we're gonna have to leave some carbon in the ground. That's a conservation narrative that isn't aligning well right now with the ecological economics narrative as co-opted by free market economics, or maybe the new economy narrative that looks a lot like a transitional growth strategy. Um, it's a narrative that really is at the roots of the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the roots of that sweeping time in our country's history when we were the leaders in the environmental movement because we were telling ourselves a conservation narrative that came out of all those movements on campuses across this country in the 60s and 70s. All right? But now you got folks our age that kind of grew up in a different narrative in the 80s and 90s and went to school in a different time where the narrative was built on an economics platform. <laughs> So, I'll end here and give it to Josh. Um, is the new economy a narrative of constraint? Is the new economy a narrative of life, a life-affirming narrative? Um, could the new economy just might save us from efficiently and equitably destroying our planet? I hope so. I'll leave it up to Josh to tell you how. So uh, I'm going to um, focus primarily on the general theme of this uh, new ownership um, society. What's the relationship of ownership of this uh, new economy? But you know, as John says, we always have. So I guess to begin with, I want to talk about why we need a new economy. But we always do have to begin with a science. We have to ground our economics <coughs> and biophysical laws. One of the big uh, proposals, one of the things they're launching here, is this idea of divesting from the fossil fuel economy. So I actually want to begin with a little bit about the importance of the fossil fuel economy. The fossil fuel economy emerged simultaneously with the capitalist economy. We started pumping or uh, getting coal out of coal mines in the early 18th century uh, at the same time that the markets were emerging. Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations in 1776 was the same time we had a better steam engine developed that would pump water out of the coal mines to really unleash the power of fossil fuels. And my view is that what we take is the magic of the market and creating this huge amount of wealth and ability to consume is really the magic of <coughs> fossil fuels. They say that if you take a barrel of oil, it would take 20,000 hours of Lance Armstrong pedaling on a bicycle to generate the energy in a barrel of oil. If we lose 75% of that energy and converting it into work, uh, that would take 5,000 hours of Lance Armstrong pedaling on a bike to compensate for a barrel of oil. At $100 a barrel of oil, Lance is a, 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 a bargain at anything less than two cents an hour. Um, so the basic point is, you know, if we transition away from this oil economy, it will be a profound difference in our society. They say the average American can do the equivalent of 340 hours work a day because of the amounts of fossil fuel we use. So this figure up here, actually, the green line, actually shows discoveries of fossil fuels, which peaked, global discoveries, which peaked in the 60s. 
The purple line shows actual extraction of fossil fuels, which you obviously can't discover, recover what you haven't discovered. And we see that extraction started exceeding discoveries in the 80s. And um, even these big deep sea deposits off of Brazil and off of Gulf of Mexico are just little blips in the green line. But the argument here is that eventually we're going to reach that point where it's just more difficult to get fossil fuels out of the ground. They're going to be less available. The price is going to skyrocket. It's going to really be difficult to power this economic growth that we're addicted to. And uh, we are profoundly addicted to economic growth. So what we've done is as the price of fossil fuels go up, we desperately look for alternatives. One alternative we find is hydrofracking. And uh, so the hydrofracking, um, you know, we're, we're figuring out ways to get at this, uh, this gas, but we know it causes very serious environmental problems. So one thing about this is we're doing this so fast. It's a finite resource. We're depleting this resource. The price of it right now is so cheap, it doesn't even cover the cost of extraction anymore. It's a profit-losing business because they've expanded supply so much. To reduce their cost, we have what they call the Halliburton loophole. We actually changed the Clean Water Act so that it no longer, uh, so that natural gas sector no longer has to pay attention to clean water. What we've essentially done is taken one of the most vital and important resources, clean water, we've reassigned ownership. Or essentially we've said there's no ownership of it and the fossil fuel sector is allowed to destroy what should belong to all of us. So this is fundamentally a question of ownership. But the point is, in our quest, to get new energy to drive our growth economy, we will sacrifice virtually anything, including our clean water. Um, so, uh, so the reasons we one of the reasons we have to shift from this economy is first of all, there are not infinite supplies of fossil fuels, and the costs of extracting those fossil fuels from the earth are generally are increasing dramatically. But there is a profound change in our economy required if we are to. Uh, transition to a new economy without all that fossil fuel. Another big issue, this is a, a well-known paper from uh, Nature, I think it was, on planetary boundaries. The places where human activities are exceeding planetary thresholds with potentially catastrophic outcomes. And you see the big ones here are biodiversity loss, nitrogen emissions, climate change, you know, a bunch of others. One of the big reasons for these problems is a lack of ownership. There is nobody who owns the atmosphere. Anybody who wants is allowed to spew their waste into the atmosphere. There's no one who owns the waste absorption capacity of our oceans for nitrogen. We dump huge amounts of nitrogen into our ocean. You see here that according to the, um, this figure, the threat from nitrogen emissions exceeds that from carbon dioxide emissions. They're talking about the rate of influx of nitrogen into our oceans can return them to their, pop, their, their fauna of 400 million years ago. Jellyfish and cyanobacteria wiping out this incredible valuable, valuable ecosystem. But and same with biodiversity law, all of these issues though, they emerge from a lack of ownership. We, you know, the, it used to be these resources were abundant. We didn't need to have ownership. So, um, so this is one of the reasons we need a new economy. And, uh, and one of the things we need to think about is who should own these resources and how should they be owned. And I'll get back to that. I'm gonna talk about the problems and the solutions. Um, Another reason we need a new economy is the increasing concentration shift, okay, increasing concentration of wealth in the hands of the few. So too few own too much. So what this shows is the share of wealth controlled by the top 1% of the United States. And you see from the Great Depression down to 1970, what we had what was called uh, the Great Convergence. So people, the, the distribution of wealth was vastly improved, became a middle class society. Since then, and I, interestingly, it's in the 1970s that this neoclassical economics, this growth first theory reemerged. That the markets are good, governments are bad. We really shifted to the Chicago School theory of economics, pushed for markets, and we saw this huge concentration in income in the hands of the few. And as most of you probably know, since the recession is officially over, 93% of new economic growth has gone to the top 1% of the population. 37% has gone to the top 1 one hundredth of a percent. We've declared the recession over because we now have growth, but that growth is strictly a concentration of wealth in the hands of the few. So this is another reason we really need a new economy. Um, at the same time as that great contraction, you know, we had this great convergence um, where uh, 
We had more middle class society, and you see that that ended in the early 70s. Until then, we had incredible reductions in poverty. Now what we see from 2000 on is increasing poverty levels. There are too many people who do not own anything, and that amount of people is increasing. And this is in the United States. It's worse even globally by far, of course. Um, so we just see too many people not owning anything, and that change in, you know, as the rich started to get more, we see poverty going up. So there's objective reasons why greater equality is good, while more shared ownership is good. This is a study done by epidemiologists in England who looked at a whole bunch of social and health problems, ranging from obesity, homicide, teen pregnancy, trust of your neighbors, uh, you know, a whole array of these indicators. And they looked at these indicators according to countries based on GDP, found no correlation whatsoever. They looked at these indicators based on inequality, based on distribution of income, and find an incredibly tight correlation with the USA way up there at the worst with the index of social problems, the more equal countries down there, and that's a very tight relationship. And the point of this study is that in unequal countries, even the rich are worse off than the middle class in more equal countries. We have more, suffer more from obesity, life, lower life expectancies, higher homicide rates, all of these things. So what is your goal for a society? If your goal for a society is to improve those indicators, which I would argue is pretty much the case, then we should be pursuing greater equality over greater growth uh, un unquestionably. Um, another big issue about ownership, so how do I think, you know, economists always talk about the efficiency of the market. It allows us to express our preferences. But what markets don't allow us to express our preferences, they weight our preferences by our purchasing power. So when food prices skyrocketed in 2007, Americans actually increased their consumption of food. While people in countries consuming less than 2,000 calories a day, less than the bare minimum required for a healthy life, had to decrease their consumption, leading to the, you know, uh, the Arab Spring, among other things, because in a market, I want to maximize my profits from food. I'm going to sell that food to the person willing to pay me the most, not the woman, destitute mother, needing to feed her children. So um, you know, we have this idea where markets allocate to those who have. Uh, we have you know, weights or preferences by purchasing power. And economists argue that preferences are first and foremost. My preference for an orange or your preference for an apple, maybe we can allow the market to solve that. But we're talking about who gets food. That's not a question of preferences. That's a question of justice and just distribution. When we're talking about whether or not we leave enough resources for future generations, that's not a question of preferences. That's a moral, ethical issue of sustainability, totally different type of value than this preferences that markets satisfy. Markets cannot address these issues of sustainability and justice. Waiting, purchasing, but waiting preferences by purchasing power is perverse on a highly unequal planet and leads to a gross misallocation of resources. Um, I also want to talk about ownership and the financial sector. And the financial sector, I would argue, allows some people to increase their ownership of the wealth of society without producing a damn thing of value. You know, as Paul Volcker, so head of the um, uh, head of the Federal Reserve Bank before Alan Greenspan, he says what I'm saying is not entirely true. He says in this time from the 1940s to 2000, when the uh, financial sector quadrupled its share of the national income, they did produce something of value: the ATM machine. And that's about it. And uh, you know that. So that we really have seen this this sector of the economy dramatically increase its share in the wealth. And what we see is as their share of the wealth goes up, we reach these points like 1929 where we have a huge crash, or 2008 where we have another crash that I would argue is just beginning. This crash is not anywhere near, it really hasn't happened yet. And what I want you to look at here, pay attention from 1929, that peak, just to 2000. So this is the share of GDP that goes to the financial sector. Now we'll look at this graph here, which is the total debt of the United States, public and private. And you see the share of wealth going to the financial sector exactly maps the share of the, the debt we hold in our country. And this is because the way our monetary system works, when you go to a bank and take out a loan, they're not loaning you money somebody else has on deposit. They're actually creating a new bank account in your name. They're loaning money that didn't previously exist. 
our money in this society is created is interest-bearing debt. So this interest-bearing debt right now exceeds the size of our economy by 350%, and it's growing faster than our economy. Now, mathematicians among you, please explain to me how we can pay off a debt of three and a half times the size of our GDP that's growing faster than our GDP. Seems to me uh, there's, there is a way to do that, and that is to systematically transfer resources from all of us to the financial sector. But in reality, even then, you know, the, the, the debt obeys the mathematical laws of exponential growth. Debt money only has value if there are real physical goods and services we can purchase with it. But real physical goods and services are limited in their growth. They can't grow exponentially. Um, you know, if we want to grow more food, it takes real land, or if we want to have more buildings, it takes energy, and it grows into a finite planet. So we are pitting this mathematical exponential growth of debt against the biophysical capacity of our planet, and this debt has to be resolved somehow. We have two ways to resolve this. So one thing is to say, guess what? This debt can't be paid. Those financial sector companies, they've got to write it off. It's impossible to pay this. So those financial sector companies are gonna to have to go down, we're gonna to have to restore their share of the GDP back to what it was, you know, it was maybe 2% in the 40s, maybe that's reasonable. Um, but what we see right now, what looks more likely, that debt has collateral. That collateral is virtually all of the land in the United States. It's virtually all of our property. We have, the, you know, the owners of that debt have the right to take away most of the wealth we have. So this, this, if we resolve this debt two different ways, one is to say we've got to essentially cancel that debt and allow people to keep their own belongings and recognize that, um, you know, transferring all resources to the financial sector doesn't work. But what we're looking at right now is quite the opposite. What Ben Bernanke and all the politicians, and if you look at this, all of the economic advisors, most of the other advisors, for Bush, Clinton, and Obama come from the investment banks who hold all this debt. And you can bet they are telling Obama that it would be desperately bad idea to allow us freeloaders to get away keeping our homes and our property, you know, when that debt can't be paid. So I really think that this is how we resolve this debt is going to have a huge impact on the new economy. The new economy is either going to be one of serfdom with the financial sector owning everything or one in which the financial sector collapses and we recognize that it was unsustainable and cannot continue. Um, and, uh, you know, and, uh, we saw a lot of, I mean, it, it, we did have a, a collapse. It's impossible not for this to collapse. Um, so my argument here is that a lot of these problems, a lot of the solutions for a new economy have got to be based on reclaiming ownership for those who should have it. And it's complicated. Different, there's different types of ownership are appropriate for different types of resources. Free market economists tell you it's always private ownership. I would argue that's completely wrong. And in many cases, you know, private ownership can't solve the big problems of sustainability and justice. So, um, so one of the things I think we have to look at is reclaiming our common inheritance from nature. So there's a wealth of nature resources that were created not by our hard work and sweat, but were created by ecosystems that evolved over time, by, you know, by gifts of nature, essentially. And these things, of all things, it seems, should be freely shared by all. And uh, you know, there, no individual created them, um, but some of these are completely unknown. So right now, the waste absorption capacity in our sky and waters, capacity to absorb carbon dioxide, the capacity of our lakes and oceans to absorb nitrogen and phosphorus, these things are unknown. Nobody owns that. Since nobody owns it, anybody who wants can use it which is why every day we spew eight times, or about five times as much CO2 into the atmosphere as it can absorb. So the problem here is lack of ownership. We need to create ownership. The question is, to whom should that ownership belong? So Europe recognized we've got to create ownership. So Europe said we're going to limit the amount of uh, waste you can spew into the atmosphere. And what do they do with that? They assign that then to the biggest polluting industries. <laughs> And they allowed the financial sector to buy and speculate in these permits for pollution, which is really the bad idea. It's not, you know, that, that is wealth created by nature. It belongs to society as a whole. 
if we want to decide how much pollution to emit, that's got to be a collective decision where um, if we are the owners of it, if we get the benefits from allowing people to pollute, but we also pay the cost when people pollute, the same person who gets the benefit, or the same the owner should account for both costs and benefits. Since those costs are global, those costs are broad scale, we need collective ownership of some sort. And it should be at the scale of the problem. So for uh, CO2 emissions, it should be at the scale, the global scale, some kind of ownership. And, um, and there are policies such as common asset trust that would declare common ownership. At, you know, at the uh, Vermont scale, Lake Champlain, well, ownership should be those who are relevant to the problem. But we do have to create common ownership, which would give us the ability to say, you know, we're going to limit the amount of waste emissions and limit the amount of, um, uh, you know, in, in the sky and water. Renewable resources can be a little bit more complicated. Um, in some cases, these are unowned as well. Oceanic fisheries. Nobody owns them. That's why we're going to fish uh, bluefin tuna to extinction shortly. That's why we wiped out the cod populations. That's why 85% of oceanic fisheries are fished at or beyond their maximum capacity. Because there's no owners. So we need, again, we need to create ownership rights. Who should that own, those ownership rights go to? Should it go to the big corporations who are overfishing? Or should it belong to all of us? And, um, and you know we can do this. We can essentially say that this belongs, and actually maybe I'll talk about it a little bit here. There is a policy right now in Vermont called the Vermont Common Assets Trust. It was put forward to the Congress and the Senate of Vermont, but unfortunately has gotten very little attention. And this policy says resources created by nature and the society as a whole belong to all Vermonters, and use of them has to benefit all Vermonters, not just now, but in the future. So it's inalienable property rights for future generations. Current markets take no account of the preferences or the demands of future generations. It's all based on the assumption that we own everything. This generation, future generations have no rights. This Vermont Common Assets Trust would create inalienable property rights for future generations. We would have a, we would have a legal obligation to leave our natural resource base as productive as we got it, to leave the reproductive capacity of our forests and our animals and our soils um, all intact, to leave the waste purification capacity, to leave the atmospheric, the, the stocks of pollutants all at the same level um, for future generations. For renewable resources, it can be difficult. You know, some farmer owns a woodlot and he wants to, you know, he bought that with the idea that he can cut down those trees and use that, and he paid a price based on that. You know, we can't just go take that away, but we can compensate. We can say that, um, you know, we're going to, you know, essentially compensate you for removing this property, right? Perhaps by charging people for the use of uh, pollution that we have now said we own the sky, um, you're not allowed to pollute it unless you compensate us, and then we could use that to essentially compensate other people not to deforest, for example. Um, and that's a little bit of a complicated issue. The state of Alaska has said non renewable resources belong to all Alaskans. It wasn't Exxon who put that oil on the ground, it was nature. It's not Exxon who should own that oil. Every time an oil company pumps oil out of Alaska, they have to compensate Alaska for the value of that oil in the ground. And Alaska has taken that money to create an Alaska Permanent Trust, puts all the money into a trust, and then pays off dividends to the citizens of Alaska. That oil is ours, they said. We did something different under the Bush administration. We used to collect royalties on oil, and he said, we're going to stop collecting those. The oil is theirs. The oil belongs to the private corporations. This allows Exxon to make us $46 billion in profits. But we can easily say that these mineral resources, these resources created by nature, they belong to all of us. A company that extracts the oil gets a fair return on its labor, a fair return on its capital, a fair return on its entrepreneurship, but it does not get $46 billion in profits when the price goes up due to nothing they did. That increase in value due to a price increase, that belongs to society not to the, the collective, not to the individual. So for these things, we do need collective ownership. And there are paths to collective ownership that make a lot of sense. So there's also our shared inheritance, not things created by nature, but value and resources created by us as a society together. The big things here are culture and information. Um, you know, so the land grant universities started out with this, not, with this idea that there's, there's two reasons, really, that information and culture should belong to all of us. One is that we all create it together. 
information. You know, if I see farther, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. None of us creates new ideas alone. We all build on the work and ideas of others. So, um, so the information was created in common to be shared in common. And another thing about this is that I'm an economist, or I'm, I'm an academic. Everything I've ever done, I've been able to do because I've been able to share the ideas of others, read what others have done, use that knowledge freely, produce new knowledge. Land grant universities were developed with this idea that we need new technologies for agriculture. And the cheapest way to develop a new technology is to share the ideas behind it. The way to make that technology the most valuable is to actively go out and educate farmers and get them to adopt those new technologies. So it's cheapest to produce when there's no ownership and the value is maximized when there's no ownership. And that was the philosophy behind land grant universities. Now what are we doing? Now we're hearing from the uh, dean of the graduate dean that we should be searching corporate funding to pursue corporate goals, to put, and we should put patents on our research, and we should make it private property, and we should really go away from that whole theory of the land-grant universities. So it's a basic law of physics. You can't do work without energy. So the nature of your energy source is a huge impact on the nature of your economy. Fossil fuels can be privately owned, <clears throat> and if I burn that fossil fuel, you can't. So we're competing for it by nature. Private ownership, competition, fossil fuels fit into the market economy. We're now going to alternative energies. We have to, to solve the problems we face. If we're going to divest from the oil economy, we need alternatives. And if you think about the alternatives, no matter how much sunshine or how much wind power we capture here in the United States, there's no less wind or sun for India and China to capture. We're not competing for that resource. You know, there's no competition there. In fact, the way we, what we need to do is develop more efficient, less polluting ways to capture that sun and that uh, wind. And that requires information, that requires knowledge. And if we develop great new technologies for capturing that wind power, or capturing that solar power, and we give those to China or India, is that gonna leave less for us? Absolutely not, quite the opposite. The Chinese and Indian scientists will work on those, improve them, and we'll get back something better than we gave them. So the basic point, in a fossil fuel economy, this private ownership makes a lot more sense because the, you know, the driving force of the economy is energy, but then we're moving into an era where the driving force, it's a type of energy we don't compete for in the same way. In fact, cooperation, collective ownership of the knowledge, the information behind it so that we can access this free resource from nature, that's the important thing. That's a fundamentally different type of system where competition is really inefficient because we have 50 firms trying to develop the next technology and they won't share their information with each other, it's likely to go a lot slower. And if somebody does get the new patent, then the other 49 firms who are searching for the same thing, all their research was just wasted effort. That's not very efficient. <laughs> and uh, if we do get these clean, efficient, alternative technologies, and we want to maximize their value, if we put a, a, a patent on it, sell it at a high price, India and China might not be able to afford it. They'll keep burning coal. So the whole point is, you know, shared ownership is efficient, shared ownership is more sustainable, and shared ownership is more just um, because it protects those who aren't burning resources. Really quickly, I've only got a few minutes, but um, I also think that the land is a very interesting thing. Um, when you buy, the value of land is rarely linked to what the owner does with it. I bought a house in, a, you know, a north, north, end, north end of Burlington, I stopped mowing my lawn because I'm kind of morally opposed to lawnmowers. And uh, you know, a lot of people would think my place looks worse, that I've let it go downhill. I mean, the house is nicely maintained, the yard is wildflowers. Um, but my house has gone up a lot in value, not because of anything I did, just because of what happened to society. What entitles me to buy a house for you know $200,000 and now I could sell it for $250,000? What hard work did I do to get that value? Why do I deserve that? And what happens if, if we had society that would take away what's called the unearned increment, that increase in land value is not associated to our labor, if we captured that in taxes, there would be zero incentive to speculate. There would no longer be any speculation of any sort, because if I speculate in land, the value goes up, and I lose all that money to the government because it's unearned income, no more speculation, no more land bubbles, no more busts, no more dramatic destabilization of our economy. Um, right now, we have very much so my view is that 100% of that unearned increment, 
100% of the benefits from uh, land from um, you know work increases the value of my land, not of my work, 100% of that should go to society. We have the total opposite uh, right now. If you look at the papers, we have these uh, real estate investment trusts where they're making money from land speculation. They have a 0% taxes on that. They don't work for it. Land values go up, they make money, they produce nothing, they do no work, they pay zero taxes. Now our for-profit prison systems are redeclaring themselves, you know, real estate investment trusts so they can pay zero taxes, and casinos are doing the same thing. So this is the most bizarre type of, you know, uh, structure imaginable. I already talked quickly about VCAT. So this picture shows countries drawn in proportion to the royalties they extract, the payments for knowledge, information, patents they have, and you see this hemorrhaging of resources from the south to the rich countries. Imagine if we use this, we develop clean, green, new technologies, we charge those poor countries to use them, that would be wildly inefficient. This is just a, a you know, this depicts what economists would call a market failure in that information does not wear out through use. It's not scarce. More and more people use it, the better it gets. This is rationing access to it. So we ration access to green technologies based on willingness to pay. We're still going to get ozone depletion, destruction of the atmosphere, all these other things. Um, you know, imagine we could have these types of technologies that are clean and efficient, but we're not going to let you use it unless you pay me a lot of money so you'll go ahead and burn coal to heat your house. Bad idea. Um, another thing that's really, really important is reclaiming the airwaves. So airwaves are a gift of nature. And we have decided, in our infinite wisdom, to turn them over for free to the for-profit sector, so that every single message we get on those airwaves is driven by the goal of making profits, driven by advertising that only pays for itself if it can convince you to buy something. And it convinces you to buy something by telling you you're pretty inadequate and you're pretty inferior and nobody's going to like you unless you buy it. You convince people to buy things by convincing people they're bad and that they need it to, or it's like, it's like Annie Leonard puts in a, um, you know, has the guy sitting watching TV and the advertisement comes out and says, you suck, and you gotta go out and buy things because the advertisers tell you if you don't, you're inferior. So we've decided that that is the way we are gonna, we're gonna decide the message you get across our airways based on profit. We have, this is the most amazing system. You know, we have a society with mo more control over information technology than ever before. We could use this to do incredible good. We could tell people about the importance of protecting ecosystems, spending time with their family, investing in all these other things that give us happiness, give us pleasure, give us a, a meaningful life, but you can't make a profit doing that. So we get this message instead telling you that if you want a, a meaningful life, you want to be happy, you better buy a lot of stuff. So we need to reclaim control of the airwaves. And this is interesting, even John McCain recognizes the importance of this. So this is not a partisan issue. Um, Really important too, we've got to reclaim finance. As I said quickly before, our current monetary system, you go to the bank, they loan you money at interest, that's a creation of new money, and that means that to pay back, banks loan into existence the money, we've got to pay back the principal plus the interest. Where does that new money come from? We can only get that new money if the economy is exponentially expanding forever. So if I'm going to pay back my mortgage, I'm going to pay back $200,000 or more for a $100,000 mortgage, and that means more money has to be loaned into existence for me to pay that back. And so we have a, a system in which exponential growth of the economy is required, and when we don't get that exponential growth, then I can't pay back my loan, and then I forfeit my property to the financial sector, and we have human misery and unemployment and poverty and financial collapse. So we have a financial system that forces us to choose between ecological collapse or human misery, and uh, ecological collapse is really human misery in the future, so we're forced to turn, choose between misery now or misery in the future. So some approaches to this are local currencies, which um, uh, Gwen Hallsmith will talk a lot about, and this is a way for us to reclaim the power to create money for the good of society. Another emerging approach is this idea of state banks, where the state owns the bank, loans money into existence, just like the conventional banks, but uses that money for the benefit of the state. So North Dakota is the only state that has a bank like that, and they, you know, when there's a natural disaster, they loan money at like zero interest, or they, you know, they use that money for the benefit of the state. There's a big movement now to get that back. But I would argue we need to fundamentally rethink our entire financial system. We need to take away the ability of banks to loan money into existence as interest-bearing debt. 
And this might sound like a radical idea, but all the best economists got together during the Great Depression said, how do we keep a depression like this from happening again? How do we prevent another collapse of our financial system? They came up with a, the Chicago Plan, which basically would take away the right for banks to loan money into existence. Banks would serve simply as intermediaries between those who want to save and those who want to borrow. And these were the leading economists of the era came up with this idea. This would take away an enormous amount of power from the financial sector. And uh, so needless to say, it's been very opposed. Um, but I would just say in February uh, of this year, another paper came up from the IMF, International Monetary Fund, arguing this same case. This is what we need to do. This is a growing movement um, that would restore the right to create money to the public sector. We would create it for public goods, not for private goods. Um, we could also decentralize the central banks so that essentially um, state and local governments could sell bonds to the central bank on the condition that they would uh, raise the taxes to pay them back, but it would decentralize monetary policy to the local level, a little more complicated than I'm going to go into in detail. Right now, Ben Bernanke is spending $40 billion a month buying toxic assets from corporations. And uh, why not? And at the same time, we're laying off teachers, we're laying off you know, uh, policemen, we're, we're <laughs> destroying our local infrastructure. Why not buy healthy bonds from municipal and uh, public sector instead of corporate toxic assets? Um, we have to reclaim corporations. And I'll be very, uh, I want to go about another minute here, because I know you guys got to go on. So healthcare, it's, it's too detailed to get into, but if Vermont goes forward to the single payer healthcare, that means we are the insurance company for Vermont. We own the insurance company. We get healthcare at a far cheaper cost. People will be talking about employee stock ownership plans later on, or community stock ownership plans. So I'm not going to go into detail on those. I really think we need to, you know, as Mitt Romney said, remember, corporations are people too. We've got to revoke this corporate personhood. The irony here, and I don't know why anybody never brings this up or points it out, the corporations claim personhood under the 14th Amendment, which gave rights to freed slaves, because apparently corporations were yearning to breathe free too. Um, but, okay, let's take them at their word. You're people, you've got personhood. Can't buy and sell each other, can't sell stocks, because you can't have, I can't own part of a person. So if corporations are persons, then they can't buy and sell. Let's take them at their word. We can also revoke corporate charters, which originally were served for a, a period on the fact that that corporation was benefiting society. So we do have leverage, leverage points over corporations. And this is very complicated stuff, and a superficial treatment does very little justice to it. Um, finally, I would just say we need to reclaim equality. And uh, what I took, the first figure I showed, one of the earlier figures I showed, was the concentration of wealth in the hands of the few. I showed the top 1% in that one. This shows that the gray line shows the concentration of wealth in the top one-tenth of a percent of society in the US. And that's on the right. The black line shows the highest tax rate. So what we see is that when tax rates go up, pre-tax income becomes way more equally distributed, which means it takes money to make money. As J. Paul Getty said, you know, uh, turning $100 into $110 is hard work. Turning $100 million into $110 million is inevitable. So if we tax away, you know, so the basic point is high tax rates lead to a middle class society. Low tax rates lead to a wildly unequal society. Um, at the end there, we see the flat tax, the tax rate didn't go up, but share of income skyrocketed. That's because I only looked at in this figure um, the uh, highest tax rate. What we did there is we slashed the tax rate on unearned income. You know, so we slashed it from like 30% to 20%. And since rich people mostly have unearned income, they don't actually work for their income, we saw a huge increase in wealth. But so we can, and you know, that these tax rates of 91% sounds pretty socialist, except that was Eisenhower. You know, he wasn't a notorious socialist. Um, we can return to those kinds of tax rates. Um, and, uh, and I would actually argue that doing this is necessary to reclaim democracy. Because I don't think anybody believes that we live in a country where we have the same say as the heads of the major corporations. Nobody believes it's one person, one vote. We pretty much all know it's one dollar, one vote. And if we want to reclaim our democracy, we need a much more equal distribution of resources. 
And, uh, and I have to say that the high tax rates are a great way to get there. And the way I look at it, you know, what tax rate is too high? Actually, I think a better question to ask is what residual is too high? You know, how much is too much money to leave in the hands of somebody? So if we had a 99% flat tax rate, um, it, would, uh, it would have left John Paulson a couple years ago with a million dollars a week. He could have got by on that. So finally, as a final word, this is all about divesting from the fossil fuel economy. It's about shifting to a new economy. You know, the importance of energy is so hard. I would say, let's divest now, but let's not just focus on getting the university to divest from the oil companies. Oil companies pump oil, they make a good profit, but they give us this resource that allows us to do an enormous amount of stuff. But we get most benefits from oil when it gets right down to it. We're the ones who've got to change our lifestyle to have less oil. So I say divest now, you know, divest from your car. Divest from your fossil fuel heating system. Divest from your agro-industry uh, food systems. And these are things we can easily do on our own. And uh, sorry I went on too long. I'd actually, uh, but uh, I'll end there. <laughs> And uh, we're going to be, uh, so we're going to be starting the session in about, next session, about 10 minutes. So just real quick, we've got uh, three sessions in the morning uh, and then four in the afternoon. Uh, topics in the morning sessions are generally going to be envisioning uh, things. So uh, talking about building the student divestment movement, uh, kind of what a cooperative economy looks like, uh, and sort of ways of measuring, uh, like alternative measurements for things like economic growth and, eco and well-being. Uh, the afternoon, we'll be kind of looking at more kind of at the sort of nuts, nuts and bolts of actually of sort of building these things. So kind of building a cooperative economy, uh, sort of investment strategies for, for money post divestment, um, you know, so, and then kind of alternative local financing mechanisms, things like uh, barter networks, credit unions, etc. Uh, and then there will also be another an additional session in the afternoon that will be um, that will be on kind of set alternatives for clean energy uh, with kind of a focus on decentralized strategies. So if you look in your folders, you'll, you'll find a map and a way to get to the uh, to, to the sessions that you so desire, and uh, we'll see you there. Can you tell us where they are? I can't find Angel on the map. Okay, Angel is...